Hello and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you all indeed for, for joining us here today. We're delighted, obviously, to, to see you. We're still just waiting on a number of, uh, of guests to arrive. So we're probably, given technology and the speed of technology, if you don't mind, we'll just hold for about 15, maybe uh, 30 seconds, a little longer. Uh, but we're pretty much nearly at full full at the moment, which is uh, is fantastic. Okay. Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, delighted to see you all here today. And I'd like to begin today by introducing our Business Alliance members, EY and BT, who are headlining today's event and a personal acknowledgement to our invited chair, EY's managing partner for the Thames Valley and Southeast regions, Mr. Richard Baker. Richard has very generously given of his time and expertise to facilitating this roundtable event today. And special thanks too are also reserved for BT's Neil Atkin and his BT colleagues who've informed this conversational space prior with their professionalism and insights and still further here today. We extend our sincere thanks to one and all. I would also like to extend apologies on behalf of our CEO, Mr. Paul Britton, Syngenta's Mr. Jim Ray and BT's Lucy Baker, who unfortunately cannot join with us here today. And so without further ado, let's kick on. Please allow me to introduce our lead partners and keynote speakers to you. Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce Business Alliance member EY, headquartered in London and are recognized as a global leader in management consulting. The firm is comprised of divisions in assurance, consulting, strategy and transactions, and tax services. With revenues just shy or just over uh, $37 billion in 2020 alone, and an employee headcount just shy of 300,000, the insights and quality of services EY deliver help build trust and confidence in the capital markets and in economies the world over. Fellow Business Alliance member BT Group, also headquartered in London, has operations in around 180 countries and is the largest provider of fixed line, broadband and mobile services in the UK. BT Group also provides subscription TV and IT services. BT controls a number of large subsidiaries. BT uh, Global Services Division supplies telecom services to corporate and government customers worldwide, while BT Consumer Division supplies telephony, broadband and subscription TV services here in the UK to around 18 million customers. With 2020 revenues just shy of 20, uh, 24 billion and employee headcount standing at 107,000, it's fair to say BT understands the communications technology marketplace. I would now like to introduce our keynote speakers for today. We shall hear first from EY's Adrian Bashnanga, who is the firm's global lead telecoms analyst. Thank you, Adrian, for joining us here today. And this will be followed by BT's Kieran Sold, who is BT's UK CTIO, Health and Social Care. These presentations will be followed by a panel discussion. And on behalf of our guest chair, I would very much like to extend a warm thank you in advance to our invited panelists for joining with fellow chamber friends here today and facilitating this discussion. Special thanks to Neil Atkin from BT, Alfonso Alvarez from Salnex, Stacey King from City Fiber, and Paul Ballinger from STL Communications. Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce Business Alliance are truly excited to deliver this presentation here this morning. There is no question the 5G agenda continues to gain momentum and unsurprisingly featured highly at the recent critically acclaimed Chamber Windsor Debate Series 2020. Back then, we heard from a number of keynote speakers who coloured some of the possibilities of 5G development and deployment. 5G itself seen as a catalyst to the economic recovery so keenly sought in these extraordinarily challenging times of COVID. Today's roundtable will seek to broaden and deepen this conversation with an unsurprisingly Thames Valley uh, 
regional emphasis and the opportunities for national leadership within this growing technological field. A technology which is seen by many commentators as an accelerator for business transformation across the private and public sectors. So as often said, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker to the virtual podium here today and a big warm welcome to EY's Adrian Bashnonga. Hello and good morning, Adrian. Hi there, Adrian, and thanks very much for that introduction. And it's a, a pleasure to be here um, today for this round table. So um, I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes or so um, running through um, 5G, what makes it interesting, what makes it different. And we've also got a very interesting perspective coming from enterprises themselves. And I think Adrian mentioned that, you know, productivity growth, um, an improved economy is, is where Britain would like to get to it. And 5G really seen playing a, a critical role in that. Um, so if I could ask that the, the slides that I'm gonna run through are um, hosted on the screen. So, so here we are. I'm, I'm going to talk through 5G really from a sort of what is it, why is it very interesting, um, a sort of high level view um, of the topic and, and then supplement that with some of our, our research and survey findings. You know, what, what's the voice of the enterprise customer in all of this? So if we move on one slide, um, this is the intro piece and we can move on again. Um, so 5G, you know, why is it different? What makes it, you know, so exciting? Well, it's really very different to previous generations of mobile. Um, it will deliver, you know, better speeds, better mobile data volume per area. Um, and that's really what we've seen, you know, when we migrated from, from 3G to 4G. The really critical difference is what 5G can do for the Internet of Things, for critical communications, and ultimately industry verticals themselves. We can it can support many more devices per area. So this densification of of endpoints really crucial to growth in IoT. Um, in terms of energy consumption, you see a step change in in benefits as well, and probably most important. Is, is further down the bottom, this improvement in latency, which is really the responsiveness of the network. And if you think of, say, autonomous vehicles, think of them as, you know, giant smartphones, if you like. In order to drive safely, the reaction time needs to be really, really low. And again, that's what 5G can bring that, that 4G simply couldn't do. And we're also seeing um, new business models come to the fore. So historically with mobile networks, they've been public networks. They've been rolled out from city to countryside over a period of years. Network slicing and, and related private network concepts allow organizations to really sort of take control of infrastructure, the ability to customize the mobile network for their very specific needs. And this kind of new virtual architecture is, is seen again as something very game changing in an enterprise environment. And on the right there, you know, we've got some comparators, if you like, in terms of real world experiences and some of the benefits that 5G can bring. So moving on to the next slide, you know, again, what does this mean in terms of enterprise transformation, the move to industry 4.0? Um, well, we've already seen, you know, the consumer market, if you like, you know, smartphone growth is, is, is plateauing, you know, everyone's got a smartphone. We've seen the boom uh, period there. But what we're in the really exciting phase of right now is this, this growth of Internet of Things. And, you know, that's been underway for a few years. Operators have had M2M solutions in place for a decade plus. But we're really seeing a combination of factors leading to an acceleration of adoption and, and 5G really uh, from a technology perspective playing a, a critical role there. And I think we've all seen in the last sort of, you know, eight months or so uh, in the light of the pandemic, all industries thinking, how can how can we accelerate our own digital transformation? So 5G, um, as mentioned, has these technology attributes which play a really important role, but it won't just happen uh, on a standalone basis. 5G will um, work alongside other emerging technologies. So whether that's AI and automation, 
but also edge cloud. So decentralized computing power and storage play a very important role. And then, of course, we've also got adjacent network infrastructures, if you like, and fiber uh, network connectivity acting as a very important underpinning of 5G network rollout. So moving on to the next slide. You know, when we think about use cases, it's it's really the sheer breadth of the opportunity here. And, and, and here we've picked out some use cases and, and some of the industry settings or scenarios where, where 5G can really make a difference. And enhanced mobile broadband, yes, that will have a lot of, um, say, an impact in the consumer market. So in terms of wearable devices or smart homes or um, offices and workplaces. Um, you know, a lot of direct impact there. But if we think about verticals themselves from utilities, transportation and logistics, remote agriculture, um, warehouses and retail sites, healthcare, you can see that there are a lot of game changing use cases where, where 5G really comes to the fore. And if we move on to the next slide, you know, this is all really interesting. Clearly, the, the, the breadth of opportunity is very wide. What does it mean for some of our sort of legacy uh, industry value chains? And on the left there, you can see really the sort of the, the technology value chain that will be supporting 5G service delivery to enterprise. And it brings together a lot of different entities from across the technology and telecommunications spheres. Um, clearly, in terms of application development, a number of entities involved in that. And that actually takes us to the right hand side of the page where we think about, you know, what's happening in the UK right now. And critically, you know, government playing a very supportive role in trying to unlock the opportunity. Uh, you can see it, it's a very regionalized opportunity. It's a very local opportunity in many ways. And, and on the right, we've picked out some of the phase one test beds set up with government backing. And you can see that they're really springing up all over the country. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, just a, an indicative list. But you look at some of the projects underway, some of the use cases, they stretch from everything to do with autonomous driving and vehicles through to um, connectivity for remote and deprived areas, smart agriculture solutions, um, a lot of um, work going into health and social care as well. So there's clearly a lot of innovation going on at the minute. It really um, does hinge upon cross-industry collaboration in a way that we simply didn't see with 3G and 4G because it's such an industry and enterprise specific opportunity. So that's the, the sort of debrief on, on, on 5G and what it can bring and, and bring to the table for the UK. The next section, um, just some insights coming actually from enterprises themselves. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we, we conducted a survey called uh, Maximizing the 5G Opportunity for Enterprise, a global survey, a thousand respondents drawn from multiple industry verticals and geographies, really trying to drill down into what they see as critical use cases uh, for 5G based Internet of Things. What are some of their priorities, but also what are some of their their pain points? What do they need from their suppliers, from their other ecosystem partners going forward? So if we move on to the next page. Here we've just got a, a couple of slides that actually break out some of these industry specific use cases. And on the left, uh, we asked organizations and here we cut it by automotive respondents. What are the most significant um, 5G based IoT applications in your industry. And really interestingly, vehicle to vehicle communications score top. That's interesting because that's a kind of use case that will really heavily depend on the latency, this very low network responsiveness that, that 5G brings to the table. On the right, we've got some healthcare use cases. And you can see top of the, top of the list there, passive collection of consumer wellness data. Um, you know, this survey was actually conducted before the pandemic, but I think that kind of use case in, in a track and trace environment has become obviously has assumed a new kind of importance. But again, here on the right, you can see the, the sheer breadth of innovation that, that healthcare 
um, workers and, and people working in the healthcare system are envisaging with IoT and 5G based IoT, remote surgery, connected hospitals, connected ambulances, clinical decision support, which could be remote training via haptic gloves, for example. So a really interesting set of use cases um, for the health system. And on the next page, um, we have highlighted um, some of the use cases coming from manufacturing respondents. So remote monitoring, inspection and diagnostics, factory robot and machine interactions, you know, shortening productivity, um, uh, heightening productivity, shortening lead times um, for manufacturing, all of this really important going forward. And on the right hand side, you know, we can see government very much as an enabler at, at national and local level for a lot of the innovation, the test beds, for example, but they will also be users of 5G um, based solutions. And here they, they've highlighted some of the, the use cases from their perspective, certainly local government services, public safety and emergency response, um, utilities management, transport optimization, uh, where we're looking at sort of intermodal transport solutions and how they all play and align with each other. Again, top of mind in, in, in the public sector. So moving on to the next page, um, you know, what are the priorities and challenges? Clearly, there's a lot of interest. Um, many organisations, those with 5G investment intentions in our survey, are thinking we need to adapt our existing IoT strategy to cater for 5G. We need to assess exactly what 5G brings that Wi-Fi and 4G can't. And we'd like to align our 5G um, uh, innovation with some of our investments in, in some of these adjacent areas like Edge Cloud, for example. And this leads us on to some of the challenges, internal challenges that are arguably inside an organization's control, complexity of integration with the existing tech stack, lack of budget support, poor understanding of 5G's relationship to some of these other game-changing technologies. And then from an external perspective, you know, is 5G technology ready enough right now? And it's worth saying actually that 5G um, isn't a big bang moment. Um, standalone 5G networks uh, will be arriving, but they're not here quite yet. And crucially, you need 5G capable devices as well. And policy and regulation, again, an area where enterprises would like more clarity. And then moving on to the, you know, our, our, our final slide on, on, on this. Um, what is the, what's the takeaway in terms of the enterprise customer perception? They're clearly aware of 5G's transformational potential, but there is a knowledge gap that they'd like to overcome. And many actually fear unless that knowledge gap is solved, um, that their businesses may be undersold on 5G's benefits. To take full advantage, they really need to reimagine their, their industry's future. And they're also thinking, what does this mean for my, my organization? Does my operating model require overhaul? And without getting all of these things right, they don't think that they can necessarily maximize the 5G opportunity. So that's the uh, the end of my intro piece, and um, Adrian, I'd like to hand back to you. And Adrian, <laughs> it could sound a, a quite strange uh, Dolly sound if we just say Adrian, Adrian, but there we go. Um, and can I just say thank you very much indeed, uh, Adrian Bashnanga from EY. That was a, a really fascinating presentation and uh, very informative. I'm sure the virtual audience will join with me in acknowledging the fantastic on-point research and uh, detailed overview which for sure will lead on the innovation for use case modeling. Thank you again Adrian Bashnanga. Can I just take a moment to remind delegates to please populate the chat box facility on your screens with your reflections, suggestions and indeed questions. Please also do take advantage of the chat box facility to connect with your fellow attendees here today and whom would like to connect further with. Please also consider to populate the chat box with your, your contact details so that fellow attendees can reach back to you directly and develop conversations further, which I'm sure will arise as we go through the programme today. Now, can I turn to our fellow lead presenter, Mr. Kieran Salt. Kieran is BT's UK CTIO Health and Social Care 
and he's going to steer us through the next presentation. Hello and good morning, Kieran. Good morning, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity today to, to, to cover um, an area in terms of healthcare and how we're actually using 5G. So I think this will hopefully to everyone illustrate the benefits of 5G within a particular vertical. Um, and I'm going to bring it to life in terms of some of the benefits that we've actually seen practically and with, with the real trust with it within the UK. So if we start on the slide deck, please. So, yeah, then next slide. So, yeah, very, very excited about the work that we've been doing in, in, in the healthcare sector um, and really sort of um, the ability to actually sort of use this, you know, in practical reasons and practical purposes with our customers or with real patients, with, with real clinicians, um, I think really illustrates some of the benefits that we're actually seeing on the 5G journey that we're on at the moment. Just as a bit of context, um, we all read about the NHS and obviously number one new uh, subject at the moment um, across the world. But we, we started some work with, with sort of Birmingham University Hospital, Birmingham, around 18 months ago, sort of pre-COVID. And it was interesting, the position there, very much of a system under pressure from a rising demand across different demographics with, within that particular region, but a very, very applicable across across all the different sort of healthcare trusts across the UK. Very much sort of people with, with multiple sort of conditions that obviously need care both within an acute hospital setting, but also within the community and, and their homes. Clearly people are living longer as well, additional pressures, and there's a real shortage of clinical skills as well. So how to effectively and efficiently use those skills um, to deliver the best healthcare for, for the population is, is some of the challenges, very much flat budgets. And, and clearly COVID then arrived sort of 12 months ago that's put even more pressure within that system. And as, as we're seeing sort of trends going forward, very much a lot of the elective routine care was postponed um, so we're sort of seeing that sort of pent up demand as well actually coming in there. So there's lots and lots of challenges for the likes of the chief executives within the trust that we're actually working with. So these are some of the initiatives and some of the innovations that we've actually been working on to start to look to address those things. So if we go on to the next slide. A key ambition of the NHS is to be actually be able to sort of deliver the best care possible to to the to the demographic within the UK, and one of the initiatives the the they're sort of implementing across there is to actually be able to uh, provide the right level of care to people in the right settings, and often people um, receive the best quality care in the community or at home rather than necessarily having traditionally going to the main acute hospital. So the idea is that that will deliver the best care for the best people in, in, the, in the community. So we've been working again with Trust to actually be able to sort of provide the enablers, the, the, the capabilities to actually allow a lot of the care to be placed and, and, and provided in, in the right location ultimately to improve patient care but also to help the sort of efficiency and effectiveness of, of the NHS so we're going to the next slide so to sort of illustrate that point specifically, we're very much working across the different care settings with the likes of the acute hospital, University Hospital Birmingham within, within the Midlands, but also the community trust as well that has lots of nurses, doctors that are actually going out there and providing routine care and, and visits to, to individuals, as well as GPs and some of the social care elements. The system by coming together and bringing the different players together to actually deliver the care for individuals is how ultimately the NHS and UK are, are going to actually deliver the best care for people. So a few of the initiatives that I'm going to talk about today are around how we're actually sort of bridging that between, you know, the expertise and the knowledge within in the acute hospitals in the community and being able to sort of provide that and enable that within within the home sector so we 
we, we have initiatives around well-being in the home as, as Adrian sort of mentioned previously but also I'm going to talk about the connected ambulance um, and the remote diagnostic work that we've actually been doing that allows care to be provided wherever in the community so if we go on to the next slide so as I say, we're, we're, we're going to highlight University Hospital Birmingham to, today, and it, it is a quite an interesting area. It's one of the largest trusts in the UK, lots of sort of demands uh, within that particular hospital. Um, and the chief exec very much talks about that sort of ongoing demand with the flat budgets to be able to sort of provide that. And who really stresses the sort of finite clinical skills that he's actually got, that he, he needs to make the most use of, but also to actually develop those skills and actually sort of right skill the, the people to be able to deliver the care that, they've, the, that they actually require within there. So we've actually got a video that we're going to show because um, I think ultimately the, the people such as the paramedic, um, the chief exec, in their own words, will sort of describe some of the challenges and how we have looked to address some of those challenges. So if we could go on to the next slide which, which uh, and, and, and play the video, that'd be great. I don't know whether we can enable the sound on the video. It seems as if there's a, a sound uh, problem, Kieran. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If we if we stop the video, then I, I can sort of talk through this um, uh, in terms of some of these sort of Sorry uh, about that. we were out, up against. Yeah. So it, it, it's really interesting. I mean, what we took was the sort of um, the paramedic within. In fact, if we go on to the next slide, actually, that 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 gives us a sort of a uh, view in terms of um, the initiative that we actually sort of worked there. So. Essentially, we took one sort of set of scenarios around a connected ambulance. The actual sort of kernel of the idea is the same, whether that's in the community care or whether that's within an ambulance. Um, the, the key is to actually provide the best tools to actually enable the clinicians to be able to do their job. So what we sort of focused on within the sort of connected ambulance was to actually sort of provide uh, the ability for the paramedic and experts within the main hospital hospital to be brought together and, and be able to do real-time triage and dialogue to provide the best care outcome. So that may actually decide on the, the treatment required for an individual you know, within the community uh, in dialogue with, with experts, for instance, a kidney specialist or, or, or a, 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 a heart specialist within the particular context. And by doing that, we were looking to bring the likes of augmented reality, virtual reality and, and 5G to actually enable that, to be able to actually have a really rich experience, to be able to actually transport the clinicians from the hospital virtually into the ambulance. So, so the, the, the images there sort of show sort of on clockwise to the, the top left is is Calamar paramedic so he's in the field actually responding to emergencies and, and, and treatment and as you can see from in the top left hand corner he's wearing a virtual reality uh, sorry augmented reality see what I can see camera to be able to dialogue to to relay real-time video and um, that's all voice activated so he can actually sort of control that and zoom in on a particular part of the body if he needs a second opinion on that. He's also wearing a glove there in the, in, in the picture, which is a sort of haptic glove that allows him to actually receive feedback on where to position, in this case, an, an ultrasound probe. So for that um, to again relay an ultrasound result in real time back to the experts within the hospital and, and the, the, the clinician back at the hospital can actually direct Callum there to actually be able to sort of position the probe in the right place. 
So that really illustrates some of the benefits of 5G that Adrian mentioned earlier in terms of the low latency. So that sort of instant sort of response to actually be able to sort of position the plate, the, the probe in the, in the right place. And there's lots of clinical benefits in terms of actually doing that because often people are not necessarily presenting a condition, but an ultrasound allows whether internal bleeding or a particular issue in terms of some of the organs that can actually be looked at in, in real time. So decisions could be made on, on how to stabilise the patient, but also what the location that the, that the paramedic should actually take that patient, because obviously it's a very time critical uh, decision to actually get the best care for the individual. In the top right hand corner, the image there shows our, our clinical expert, Dr. Tom, um, with his perspective in terms of actually being transported into the ambulance to actually see everything that's actually going on, on there. And he's using a virtual reality headset there to actually actually sort of see and, and be immersed where, within the context that he's actually working. Um, and the sort of bottom windows there sort of show and illustrate the view that he actually has. So um, we're in embedding also the view of the sort of close-up camera, the results of the ultrasound, 180 degree view inside the ambulance, the vital signs that are actually coming through and the care record for the individual. So again, the benefits of 5G to have sort of three high quality video feeds sort of showing exactly what's going on in real time augmented by the sort of vital information that needs to be seen as part of that. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll, I'll sort of show how we sort of develop some of that ideas going forward as well. Just, just one note as well, this was all done on the on the public 5G network as well. So that the, the ambulance was in a sort of community setting about four or five miles away from the main um, UHP hospital. So everything was done sort of in, in real time and for real over the, over the public 5G network. That was the first in, in, in Europe to actually do that. So we're sort of very proud um, of bringing that to, to, to life for the, for the healthcare and for the NHS. So we've developed that, this idea, uh, the NHS trusts BT to provide the key infrastructure within the Nightingale hospitals as well across the country. And again, working co-creation with, with UHB, we, we developed an idea of a remote diagnostic kit, which can be shown in, in the sort of bottom left hand corner that actually shows the likes of an ECG, a sort of remote stethoscope um, that can actually sort of provide sort of, again, the, the audio of people's chests and, and hearts, the likes of the ultrasound probe um, and, a, and another sort of ultrasound capability to be able to actually show different types of conditions that an individual will have and that's all being used now by UHB within the sort of community setting within a, a transient setting as well um, but the potential is is huge within there not only within obviously the, the Birmingham region but across the UK in terms of actually providing care within GPs uh, settings on their visits in the community nurses care homes midwives and the ability to actually bring together expertise in real time to make the best decisions then rather than lots of uh, follow-up appointments and lots of delay within within the process so i think in, in terms of time i know, I, I know we're short for of, of time but hopefully that sort of illustrates the power of 5g in terms of actually bringing people together with very rich information to make the best care decisions um, for individual all enabled through enabling infrastructure like 5g cloud and and some of the sort of medical diagnostic equipment that, that's that's been pioneered within within the uk Kieran, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, fascinating presentation. Some of the feedback on the chat uh, already uh, emphasizing that point and uh, well done as well on the improvise on the technology. Uh, a really great showcase and uh, a, a wonderful to see the application of world-class uh, technology in action uh, and happening already. So uh, really, really great stuff. Can there be anything more noble than saving lives? Uh, I ask myself. A great application of the technology. Um, I would now like to hand over to our invited chairperson for today's roundtable. It's EY's managing partner for Thames Valley and the Southeast. It's Mr. Richard Baker. Uh, Richard, hello and good morning. Okay, th thank you, Adrian. Thank you for inviting me to uh, the, the chair today. Very um, welcome. And good morning to those. You know, I, I know I know plenty of uh, 
familiar faces on the course. So that's great to see you all. Um, fair amount of my career has been spent in the telco industry. Not recently, however, but but uh, have to say that 5G really feels very, very different to previous evolutions of wireless technologies and, uh, you know, less, well, it, it will enhance the consumer experience, but really, really kind of transformational opportunity for many business models across multiple sectors. So delighted to have Neil Aitken from BT, Alfonso Alvarez from Cellnet, Stacey King from City Fiber, and Paul Ballinger from SPL Communications. So, so let's get into it. We've got a couple of questions to get us going. Um, so what, what I'd like to ask the panelists is, could you share something of how you see the 5G opportunity for your organization and the role that uh, you aim to be playing in the overall ecosystem? And I'd like to ask that question of Neil first, Neil. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, I, I feel very privileged to be coming straight off the back of those fantastic presentations from, from Kieran and Adrian because they've, they've really set the scene in terms of the context of, of, of what 5G can do. And also, if you remember back to that slide Adrian had, the, the use case that Kieran talked about was one of kind of a whole plethora of, of, of different ones. But I think the really important point for us, I mean, everyone will know BT, uh, as an organisation, our, our kind of purpose is to connect for good. And so that means becoming the world's most trusted connector of devices, people. Um, and really, the, when it comes to the, the 5G opportunity, I, I think it came through already, but I'd just like to amplify that this is about co-creation. This is about leveraging BT's expertise, both as a, a network provider, so obviously EE is part of the BT group and we've already got 5G in over 100 places throughout the UK, but we fully recognise, and, and Kieran's example was a fantastic one, when, when it comes to actually um, putting the application of the technology, the people that understand the challenges that, that we're trying to solve, the problems that we're trying to solve, are our customers, they're, they're the organizations that we work with. So really what we want to do is we want to take the expertise like Kieran has, and we want to speak to customers, we want to speak to the public sector, and we want to co-create in, in a place-based way that can really you know, use 5G to solve problems rather than to be a bauble of new technology. Um, and, and so th that's, that's our, our approach really. And I think something else that came through quite strongly is, is it's interesting the way that the development of 5G, I think there's a real kind of place-based aspect to this. So um, the, 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 the project that Kieran talked about is a partnership with um, University uh, Hospital in Birmingham. But obviously that will have wider applications right the way throughout the UK. But the, the kernel, the, 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 the seed of this is finding a partner in a local area, and that could be in the Thames Valley, that could be anywhere through the, throughout the country, BT has other examples as well. Um, but, but taking that opportunity to combine expertise in a sector with expertise in the technology and, and use that to, to solve a problem and, and really kind of, you know, d deliver societal benefit really. So yeah, that's, that's okay. what I would say. No, thank you very much, Neil. Alfonso, can I come to you next? Yes, thank you. First of all, uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Selnex Telecom, but in three words, I will let you know that Selnex Telecom is a telecom infrastructure provider. We are a neutral host. We manage uh, mainly for the MNOs, the mobile operators, uh, our passive infrastructures, towers, rooftops, fibers sometimes. And not only that, sometimes also involving active equipment for indoor connectivity, uh, big venues, etc. So, of course, we are looking at 5G as a very important business opportunity. And in fact, we are in the middle of, of uh, the 5G rollout supporting our customers, uh, in BT, everything everywhere, Vodafone, Telefonica, and Hutchinson mainly, uh, in their own 5G rollout around the country. But it's not only that. I mean, uh, there's a, a very good opportunity about 5G, in particular in the UK, which is private networks. In other countries, uh, it's not possible to have access to the spectrum, to the frequencies, if you are not a mobile operator. In the UK and other countries, like the Nordics and France, uh, it's possible to ask for a small uh, amount of frequency 
spectrum to Ofcom for a particular purpose. So a big industry, a corporation, uh, mostly thinking of industry, I mean, uh, manufacturing and so. For example, some of the, of the examples, uh, marvelous that Kiran has showed could be deployed in a different environment by a company uh, which prefers to have their own resources and their own radio equipment. So as Celnex, we also want to be very active in, in, in being involved and dealing with uh, big industry groups that could be interested in deploying their own 5G networks and uh, maybe are not uh, capable of uh, making the investment alone. So we can be there funding the deployment and supporting those enterprises in creating their own networks. So uh, 5G is clearly our next uh, business opportunity and we, we want to be honestly a national leader and supporting the UK as a country for being uh, a global leader as well. Okay, no, thank you, Alfonso. And, and really interesting, I'd, I'd not pick that up about private networks as well. So that uh, adds uh, both a, an opportunity and a complexity, I am sure. Um, Stacey, could I come to you next? Sure, thanks, Richard. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Stacey King, and um, I am the regional city manager for City Fibre. Some of you may know City Fibre, we are actually the third largest um, infrastructure provider and currently um, rolling out next generation fibre broadband, full fibre broadband across, across the UK and with some specific focus on the Thames Valley. And this is a subject that's really, really close to my heart. I think um, two, two things really. So one, in order for all these wonderful applications that are very exciting that 5G will offer, they need fibre in the back end. So to transmit that data, it all needs to be powered by fibre. So Part of my role at City Fibre is really about making sure that we get fibre into the ground as far as possible right across the region. And that part of that is about making sure that we engage with businesses, um, but also with the local authorities who have a huge role to play in this and making sure that the environment is right for us to be able to do that. And part of that is around the digital transformation of public services. And I see somebody in the chat has already, already talked about that. You know, I think one of the, the biggest opportunities um, and challenges that we have is around how we transform our public, our public services and what that's going to mean. I think local authorities have for a long time been um, struggling with their role and, and, um, and their funding. And the, the recent COVID um, situation that we all find ourselves in has made that situation even even worse um, and has also brought to the fore I think the reliance on technology and technology like 5G. So for us it's about helping those local authorities understand how they can how they can really make this a reality, how they can change their business um, so that it's fit for the future and it serves them and us as businesses and residents better um, and also about making sure that the network, the underlying network is there to support all these wonderful applications that are going to come out. No, thank you, Stacey. No, really interesting. Um, and Paul, S STL Communications. Um, so something of how you see the 5G opportunity and um, the role you're looking to play within that. Yeah, OK. Good morning, everybody. Um, I feel like a very small part of this um, stood shoulder to shoulder with some giants this morning on this call. Thank you so much. And I'm delighted to say we've we partnered with City Fibre as well. So understand exactly what Stacey's talking about. Um, probably worthwhile just explaining who SDL are because we're not obviously a BT, but we, uh, we're 25, old, 25 years old next year, um, which is a great place to be. Uh, we're a reseller of IT and communications. We're business to business based in Whitney. I would say 70 to 80 percent of our customer base sit within the Oxfordshire into the home counties area. We partner with, from a mobile perspective, O2 Voda, Gamma and Jola, for those that know that. We're delighted to be um, a, a partner of choice with City Fibre uh, through our historical internet connection, which is nearly 20 years old to the next year. Um, recently, we've been supplying 4G as a backup for fixed line services because of COVID and home working. And maybe Graham, this goes some way to answering your question. 
Um, we don't see 5G right now as a necessary replacement for fixed line services, but it certainly could be. There are one or two challenges around it because if you've got a fixed line service, typically a lease line, and you're running voice and data services over it, the testing that we've seen, um, I don't believe yet SIP has been standardized over 5G. So you could have some voice services, which um, let's face it, we all expect that to work 24 seven. Um, there's still some challenges with that. Um, but I think SDL's role and the other resellers in the UK, our, our, our purpose is pretty straightforward. It's about educating the customer what 5G can do for them. And we've heard already from um, some of the contributors it's just about thinking about the different ways you can do it. We've seen examples of 4G already this year, where anything from genuinely tied to the tail of a, a, a cow to tell the farmers when to go out to field when they're going to give birth, because apparently the tails start wagging furiously, so they could see this on a 4G SIM card. This is bizarre. When the bins are full at Heathrow Airport, so you don't pay somebody for just going out and checking to see empty bins all the time. So time becomes useful and categorized. But proving these points through case studies and, and demonstrable benefit, I think is the key thing. I think, Stacey, this is what you touched on with local gov. How do we explain what 5G is going to bring other than it's just faster? Because they need to see that material benefit as all customers need to do. Um, I think there's some things that need to happen to allow that to move forward. Um, We've seen a big shift this year in eSIMs delivering 4G. So I think we'll find that carrying on for 5G. That allows, as we've heard, um, single access points so we can provide better management for the customer. So if you change a tariff over a, a single network, you can do it via an eSIM through almost like single touch, whereas changing tariffs on non eSIMs, you've got to change every single SIM card, which is a challenge if you're changing priorities, policies, and we'll see better management through that. We'll see layer three and layer four filtering, which will enhance security, which is obviously with home working is always a consideration. Okay, no, thank you, Paul. And, and, and I think, you know, just, just the, the, the range of companies represented on this panel, even though it's quite a, a small range, relatively speaking, shows you the, the different roles that many, many different play, people have, and, companies have to play in the value chain. And I think to, uh, right from the largest organizations through to supporting, you know, individual farmers or whatever. So, uh, no, no, really important. And that's one more question uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the round for the panel. And then I think that there's some really interesting points coming through on the, on, on the chat. So could I encourage everyone to keep things coming through on the chat? So, so my, my other main question is if, if we roll forward, say three to five years, and we picture a future where the UK has become a real clear leader in the uh, exploitation of 5G and internet of things. Um, when we look backwards, what do you think are maybe the, the, the main one or two critical success factors you think um, were, were, were fundamental to the journey the UK went through and maybe the decisions that sort of got made in, in 2021 maybe? So I'm just going to reverse order on that. Paul, would you like to pick up that first? Um, yeah, happy to do so. You, you probably won't hear this for the last time as an answer to this question. I think um, the, there is an elephant in the room, re Hawawa. I think that just needs to be um, decided or extricated from network build. Um, I think in some of the testing I've seen, Line of sight has affected speeds. I'm not saying that's affected latency, but it's certainly affected speeds. Um, being able to provide fixed IP addresses, we might be getting a bit technical here, but um, that gives um, a lot of applications and a lot of management control down to the enterprise as well. And it's gonna be very interesting to see how the carriers uh, being agnostic, manage roaming capability. Um, you know, we see now on SIM card, people jump from carrier to carrier um, to keep the strongest signal. Is that going to be the case for 5G? Or are people going to want to return? 
heavy tariffs for as long as they possibly can to uh, pay back for the investment. Okay, no, no thanks. Well, it's, it's a range of a range of interesting things, and well, you know, let's let's not try and solve those today. But but those yeah. would be things that you think are pretty critical to to solving, particularly on the on the technical front. So, uh, Stacey, can I come to you next with with your view of what might be the one or two top critical success factors? Yeah, sure. Um, so my view is really one of the key ones is around the kind of fear and uncertainty around this subject. So while there, it's, it's hugely exciting in terms of some of the innovation that we've, we can see in some of the applications, I think from a um, consumer perspective, there's a lot of fear around 5G. What, what, what is it? There's lots of health scares around it. So I think as an industry, we've got to do better at articulating what the real benefits are um, and helping consumers to feel comfortable with it. I think government has got a role to play in that and for making sure that the regulation and policy environment works for it. I think um, talent. So in the region, we already know that we have a skill shortage within um, digital and technical skills. We can see this coming down the line. So I think, you know, fast forward three to four years, if we're going to be successful, we need to get ahead of that and really start making sure that we have that, that base of talent to take this forward. Um, and you said two, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just one last one and, and the kind of innovation ecosystem around this cross industry collaboration. You know, this is, it's not going to be, it's, it could finance, the way the finance model works, it's gonna have to change. And I think it's gonna require much more collaboration to make this work going forward. Yeah, no good. I, I think it's a really big crunchy issues there, Stacey, that, that again, I think, I, you know, I agree with you, they're going to be really critical going forward. Um, Alf Alfonso, what, what would you add? To my mind, I think there are two main elements we need to consider in the UK. First, um, 5G is not only radio access, it's also a transformational um, deployment of a new backbone for all the operators and this will arrive uh, maybe in a couple of years, three years. So there's a first thing as a country we need to cope with, which is uh, the Huawei ban. I mean, the United Kingdom uh, has decided to forbid or to stop the deployment of Huawei equipment. And uh, this is not impossible, of course, and other providers exist, but uh, the mobile operators mainly, because the radio access is being deployed now, are trying to react as soon as possible, signing agreements with other providers, you know the story, Nokia, Ericsson, et cetera. So they are trying to keep on their track in terms of deployment. But of course, this has been a, a, a very important uh, thing to be let's say, considered in their network deployments. When we speak about the backbone in the future, um, overcoming the situation, who are we not being part of this, will be something also difficult to reassess because Huawei has been one of the global leaders in deploying the 5G ecosystem. So in terms of defining potential risks, this is one uh, the UK will need to to work with and to, I mean, the, the 5G ecosystem, operators, vendors, um, uh, developers, etc., will need to adapt the rhythm. A second condition I think the UK should take into account is um, 5G is not only more speed. I mean, we are not deploying 5G for accessing in a quicker way to WhatsApp with videos. Allow me this joke. We are deploying 5G mainly thinking of the industry. So there's, there are two paths here. I mean, being a passive receiver of use cases coming from vendors, from other companies in other countries, etc. So inheriting what other countries invent or really creating a 5G UK ecosystem involving everybody, universities, spin-offs, uh, developers. I mean, defining end-to-end -end models, which could be transferred as well to other countries. And this will, this would mean the UK is a global leader in 5G. So local fabric, local ecosystem is key. 
for uh, succeeding in this world. No, brilliant, Alphonse. I can know. No, great point. Great point. And N Neil, Neil, well, just, yeah. just a quick one or two items. Well, I, it sort of builds directly on what Alphonse was just said, and actually a, a comment from um, Graham Philpot in the chat as well. So uh, I think one of the kind of critical enablers here will be government seed funding investment. So um, to, to answer Graham's question, th th there are already 5G test beds throughout the country, and I think some of them featured in, in Adrian from EUI's slides right back at the start. But it does go back to that co-creation point. And to Alfonso's point, there is the opportunity for us here in the UK to really drill down into what the what the problems are that we're trying to solve here. You know, what 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 do businesses and organizations in the Thames Valley, what 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 do they want to solve? And putting their heads together with with the expertise from BT and a range of other people to to come up with those solutions. Now Government test beds can facilitate that already. You know, one uh, an example we can give is BT is involved with the Worcestershire five G test bed. So already to to sort of pick up on a, another thread of the conversation, that's that's building a, a private five G network to sort of have automation in factories. But the start point for that is working with Worcester Bosch to work out the challenges they're trying to solve and developing a solution. So. That those government test beds can play an absolutely crucial role in that, um, I, I, and I think you know, the, if if we're imagining five years hence, then the success of those will play a, a huge role in in the UK becoming global leader. And one just very quick final point, I, I think that the time frame is interesting as well. So five years from now is 2025. Um, I, I think most people on this call will know about the, the government's ambition for gigabit connectivity by 2025. It's important that we see 5G as, as part of uh, you know, a, a wider range of, of complementary technology. So Stacey's mentioned fibre has to be the backhaul for, for 5G. We, we need to think about this in the round as well. So there'll be specific applications for industry that, that arise from 5G, but um, getting the UK connected up to, to gigabit speeds is going to be hugely important, both for businesses and consumers too. Yeah, no, sure. So I'm, I'm generally summarising the, all, all the things, well, at least the main things. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I've missed some things, but there's, you know, industry having the problems to solve and, and and collaborating to solve those issues you've got the the innovation ecosystem that comes together to solve those problems there's, there's the how do we build the enabling infrastructure given some of the challenges with some of the players you know the global players as well um, and that's not just 5g it's also the complementary technologies and the other thing i kind of w would add to it which is uh, which kind of got alluded to which is just what is the actual funding model which supports all of this? And, you know, we are going to need government. And that sounds like, you know, central, but also local government, as, as Stacey was pointing out earlier, to, to, to work together on that. Um, I, I guess what Stacey also alluded to is just, and, and you did, Neil, which is just how does the, the, how does the Thames Valley feature in this? How does the Thames Valley seek to be a, a, a leading proponent, a, a good practice example. You know, we've got so many of the good companies based in the region that will play quite a key part. And we've got a lot of industries, multiple industries. Um, you know, and I think that's another another big question. But but let's let's just try and pick up a couple from the audience for a second. Um, um, I, know, I know people referred to, to, to Graham's question. Um, Alan asks a question, a lot of pounds available across different sectors to support research and innovation, but how do we generate enthusiasm to create new partnerships and new supplier chains? Anyone, anyone got, you know, a, a, an obvious next step or two that we could try and do that in the region? So I'm just asking you as panelists, so just to... Well, if, 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 I, if I take the example of the of the Worcestershire 5G testbed, so so that is um, the, the main sponsor for that is the, the LEP in the area. So I think LEPs have, have a key role to play here in bringing together the, the business community, you know, both providers and, and, and our customers that are trying to solve problems. And, and that can be the spark for innovation. So, um, you know, BT is, uh, invests huge amounts in research every year. Um, you know, we have uh, our 
research facility in the Dashwood Park out in Suffolk, that, that there's the opportunity for hothouses and co-creations that can lead to proposals that can go into to government um, 5G test beds and other projects. So, so that can play a, a vital role, I think. Yeah, and no, I understand. Stacey, would you have anything to add as to what, what actual first step we could take? <laughs> sorry, I, it's actually just after 11 and I'm just about to, to, to disappear. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Stacey. Apologies for that. Um, I mean, I think I actually agree with, with Neil. That would have been my, my first okay. initial thought is around, I think there's a role for the chamber to pay, play here um, and for the, the likes of the LEP to bring together um, those different businesses from different from different sectors um, across the EK system, <coughs> excuse me, alongside with that government funding that, that will be required, I think, in order to, to spark that that innovation and that change. Um, and I think if people want to um people have ideas and thoughts about what we should be doing, shout, you know, re reach out, use the chamber, use the LEP. You know, if, if you think City Fiber as an organisation is something, it's an organisation you want to work with, reach out to me, reach out to Neil, reach out to Paul. You know, I'm sure from an industry perspective, there is, um, you're pushing against an open door. There's a lot of willingness here to do this. And I think there's also recognition that we don't have all the answers. Um, and, and so we're looking for, as I think it was Neil that said, people within the Thames Valley, let's think about what it is we want to solve here you know what do we want to be known for in in this region we've got lots of the innovators that already sit here we've got a, a, a good base in terms of you know the network being rolled out across both with us bt but in all of the infrastructure providers i hear providing network so that's not going to be i don't think the issue the issue will be about what are the real user cases that we want to champion in this region yeah, no, understand, understand. No, good. All right, thanks, Stacey. We must let you go because I know yeah, you. Yeah, apologies. You did, sorry. We did, we did promise. <laughs> good. But can I just come back to one specific question for? I don't know whether um, uh, Kieran is still on the call. Kieran, there was there was a question around um, how do patients feel about their very personal data being transferred over the, you know, over the, yeah. over, over yeah. the network? Is it, got an Absolutely. Yeah, really, really valid and good, good point there. I mean, uh, in our experiences of working in sort of co-creation with 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 hospital trusts, the the view is as long as people know how data is being used and for what purpose, and the fact that it's for to direct their medical and, and healthcare rather than being sold to some corporate somewhere for 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 other means generally people understand that there's huge benefits there to get the best care um you know possible so the fact that you know other people are actually seeing a, a consultation obviously needs to be addressed to the individual so they sign up for that but as long as the intent of how that's actually being used is is described and understood then people are supportive of it because ultimately it it, it leads to better outcomes clearly the infrastructure needs to be highly secure so the information governance processes for the nhs need to be followed as well so the data is all secured and obviously the data handling is is of the of the, of the necessary standard um so i think you know those are the possibly the sort of two areas that that, that that need to be focused on there yeah no good all right thank you very much um we, we're just coming up to time and i i, I can see that you know there's, there's a lot of really good both suggestions and questions in the chat. So I think Sorry, Richard, as long as you're here, we, we, we missed your question about funding. Very quick point. Okay. Uh, now we are in the starting stage of 5G. So everything is about innovation, about uh, defining test beds, etc. But in the long run, when the industry will uh, think of 5G as an alternative for maybe increasing efficiency or reducing costs etc uh, private funding that means uh, instead of investing going to the bank and acquiring technology playing with actors like Selnex of course I'm meaning uh, big industries big industrial groups um, uh, could be and, and in fact this is our model uh, can be perfectly a, a possibility someone else a vendor or a company like Selnex 
providing the technology, installing it, providing a service, and also, I mean, in a fee, um, considering also the impact of assets. So funding the service, the end-to-end -end 5G ecosystem to be deployed as a commodity. This is something we are working on. So funding shouldn't be a problem. And, and, and I know the operators, the enterprise, uh, business units of the MNOs are considering similar models. So funding wouldn't be a problem if uh, uh, the right opportunity for the deployment is there. Yeah, I guess, uh, and you know, it's pretty clear to me that the, the value creation opportunity for the, you know, the recipient organizations who are transforming their business models or productivity or cost basis or new revenue streams through it, um, ultimately there's enough value being created. I, I think just sometimes it's a challenge as to how that value, you know, the sequence of it gets spread across the value chain as it were. So, um, but uh, no, li li listen, we, we, we've identified quite a few big issues there. Um, and, and I think plenty to, to fuel a, a, you know, a future discussion uh, in, in, in very many different dimensions. So without further ado, let, let me thank the, the, the four panelists. So, so Neil, Alfonso, Stacey and, and Paul, Thank you very much for, for joining us today and sharing your perspectives. Really, really good. And I'll hand back to um, to David, who's going to just take us through some uh, final final slot. Excellent. Thank you, Richard, and compliments to the panel. What a fantastic roundtable. Um, I've got pages of notes. Thank you so much. I'm going to highlight three events. If you can um, jot these in your calendar, please, everybody. The, the first one is our um fourth in series mental well-being uh webinars uh entitled the bottom line is getting the elephant out of the room uh the date on this is wednesday the 9th of december from 2 30 to 4 o'clock uh we've got colin woodley ceo of iso limited who will speak on happiness and the bottom line balancing team well-being with running a successful business um which will highlight some of the real challenges when you've got to run a business and you want to look after your staff. It's okay having top line ideas, but um, the practical application is where sometimes it gets unstuck and we're, we're looking forward to discussion around that. And then Sally Hansen um, will be speaking on getting the mental health elephant out of the room, uh, chaired by Stuart Carroll and Claire Lyons Collins. So in, if you, in your organizations, anybody interested in mental wellbeing, Wednesday the 9th, at 2.30. The second event is our business manifesto launch. Uh, our manifesto sets out the opportunities and challenges our membership want to champion and which we believe will have the most impact, committing the chamber to lead, support and campaign for a programme of activity across the region in 2020. Our theme is restart, rebuild, renew. Um, we have Fleur Chandler, Head of Market Access, Sanofi, sharing reflections on the collaboration and contribution from the scientific community in pursuit of effective COVID-19 vaccines. And we have Professor Chris Tucci, Professor of Digital Transformation and Strategy from Imperial College, um, talking about the role of digitalization in growth and renewal. That's Thursday, the 10th of December at 10 a.m. And finally, um, just a just a flag to an event that we're planning in Q1 with Page Group and Blake Morgan, looking at post-Brexit, people analytics and the impact on immigration and talent. Um, we will hear more, more from Adrian on this. Thank you, that's my slot done. David and Richard, thank you very much indeed. And indeed, of course, a warm thank you to our panelists. Um, so easy to forget to thank um, everybody for participation here today. So I'm going for the, the easy catch-all by simply extending a broad thank you to the entire production team, uh, the TVC board and the back office personnel who worked tirelessly to make events such as today possible. Um, presentations 
top drawer, absolutely fantastic. Lots of questions. Uh, thank you very much indeed to everybody who did contribute the, the questions. Apologies if we didn't get to them all, but as there will be a follow-up communication, it's certainly giving us uh, a lot to think about and we will formulate the appropriate uh, reply. But of course, we will reconvene. Uh, that particular activity isn't in the diary just yet, uh, but we will revert to you uh, again as a follow-up to today. And of course, as we heard, there's a number of different asks in front of us with regards to how we can probably broaden uh, the conversation and invite other participants to join into this important pressing conversation. Can I just say uh, thank you to the panelists, thank you to our chair for managing the time. Uh, it's, it's always tricky. I mean, the questions were fantastic. The answer is even more fantastic and uh, certainly plenty of scope there that we could have run over uh, by significant margin. But thank you all for your sensitivity with regards to that item. Can I actually also just mention, of course, to our lead business uh, alliance partners, EY and BT, for lending uh, their personnel to this event here today and to their ongoing support of the Chamber. To Sarah Irving and our marketing team, uh, always very busy in the background, uh, coordinating everything, often unseen, but actually hugely appreciated. Similarly, our head of IT, John Higgins, has been uh, hovering around in the background and making the connectivity work today. Thank you, John. Our business alliance colleague, or my business alliance colleague, David Saab, for his contribution today and ongoing. Also, our MST colleagues uh, who contributed and signposted a number of participants to this event here today under the leadership of Gavin Spencer. Thank you very much indeed for your contributions. Our CEO, Paul Britton, his executive VA, Madhu Hafiz. I, it, it could be a long list, but it is important, I guess. It is our first round table. And just to recognize also on the EY side, Richard and his back office team, Rachel and Natalie, always available, fantastic. Oliver Rees Brennan, thank you very much indeed for your contributions, and uh, EY presenter Adrian Bashnonga. BT's Neil and Lucy, unfortunately in her absence, but Kieran did a fantastic job here today, um, deputizing in many things and improvising in many things, but uh, you delivered a really fantastic presentation, resonated with everybody, and it's driven a lot of questions, and uh, we look forward to building out the user case modeling. Thank you for your time here today and ongoing support of the Chamber of Commerce. Finally, you've been listening to me, of course, uh, Adrian McMahon, Business Alliance Manager with the Thames Valley Chamber and uh, the lead on this event. Uh, delighted with the success of today and the participation of all stakeholders. Wishing everyone a safe and peaceful Christmas, of course, with your loved ones in this time of, uh, of COVID. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a pleasant day and weekend ahead. And until the next time, do take care. Every best and goodbye. Thank you.